Ecological Impacts Panel. This morning, we heard about the various ways in which plastics intertwine with our lives. Our goal for this panel is to look a little more deeply at um, what we know, and more importantly, what we don't know, uh, about the effect of plastic accumulation in the ocean and on the environment, and what programs are in place at the government level to start addressing some of these issues. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Richard E. Hyman from uh, Future Frogmen, who will be introducing and moderating our panel today. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thanks to MIT Water for, for having me and for having our panel. We've got a great panel. Uh, prepared to talk about health and ecological impacts of plastic, macroplastics, microplastics, et cetera. Um, we've got a good presentation for you from each person as well. I'll introduce folks in a minute, but uh, I just wanted to show you uh, this photograph and looking at our, our blue marble, planet Earth, that we, uh, we sort of take for granted, I think, but uh, things have been changing more so than ever. And uh, a man that I worked for when I was a young man, Jacques Cousteau, said, protect what you love. People protect what they love. They love what they understand, and they understand what they are taught. I think that's why we're all here today, because we all care. We, we love what we're doing. We love our planet Earth and everything associated with it, our loved ones, the environment, the creatures, and so on. So uh, I just wanted to share that thought with you and uh, share with you that uh, I started a nonprofit after a business career several years ago. I started a grassroots um, initiative. Diana, I really enjoyed your comments. Uh, they resonated on many fronts. And uh, that's why I'm doing this, because I came back to my real love, which is our water environment. I have a bias towards the oceans, but uh, at Future Frogmen, this nonprofit that I started and I run, we, we look at all water, uh, most certainly. And uh, we're focused on learning and exploration, learning about water environments through learning and exploration. It's a funny name, Future Frogmen. I wrote a book called Frogmen about my time with Cousteau, and one of the young ladies that works with us when we first started this, she said, Richard, why don't we just call it Future Frogmen? So I just uh, ran with it, and uh, I respected this young lady, and uh, we're having fun with it. If you're not familiar with that maybe sort of ugly fish, it is a frogfish. <laughs> That's why we uh, picked it. And uh, Katerina, who is a uh, master's student at Clemson, designed that for us. Working with uh, about 30 colleges and universities in the US as well as in Canada. And uh, uh, we have a partnership with MIT Water as well. And uh, if you want to learn more, check out futurefrogmen.org. There are many opportunities to get involved with what we're doing. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and love to engage with you. Uh, I've got several interns from universities now and uh, have open opportunities as well. So 2019 was a great year for us, and 2020 is going to even be even better. So you saw that picture before of Earth. This fellow. Rusty Schweikart, he took that picture. This is Apollo 9. He was the lunar module commander of, uh, on, on Apollo 9 in 1969. I worked for Rusty at NASA headquarters after that, um, years after that. But uh, he's a very cool man. And uh, he graduated, his undergrad is from MIT. And he got his master's in aero space and aeronautical engineering from MIT in 1963. And six years later, he was commander of the lunar module um, on Apollo 9. Pretty cool. So when I think about my mic OK still? Yeah. Uh, I saw this picture two days ago. Wow. And it really impacted me personally. And uh, uh, it was in Nature magazine. Uh, the uh, it's a jaguar in the wetlands in Brazil. So we're talking about the pervasiveness of the scourge of plastic of all sizes, small and large. And uh, the photographer, he had a quote in there saying it was probably attracted to the scent. 
and very possibly so, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it, this is an example, as we all know, how pervasive plastic pollution is. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our panel. Our panel starting on the far side here is Demi Fox. Demi is with NOAA. And Sharon, or Karen, excuse me, Karen, is in the middle. Karen is with the EPA. And John Scott from uh, University of Illinois. And uh, they're each going to share a presentation with you. And we're going to start with Demi. Thank you. Perfect. So hi, my name is Demi. I'm the Northeast Regional Coordinator for the NOAA Marine Debris Program. I always have a little bit of like, oh, when you say this is Demi from NOAA. I live in Gloucester. If anybody's ever been to Gloucester, it's a very old fishing town, and I don't usually associate myself with NOAA when I live there because it's a, it's a really good way to get harassed. But I do work for NOAA. Um, <laughs> the Marine Debris Program was established in 2006 as the federal lead on marine debris, and we operate on five different pillars. So for us, removal is obviously a lot of derelict fishing gear, lots of lobster gear. This is Aaron um, cleaning up derelict lobster gear off the coast of Maine. For prevention, that's usually education and outreach projects for us. We do have one active prevention project in the region right now that's working with college students and their cigarette littering behavior. Research is largely focused on microplastics. We'll talk a lot more about that. Emergency response might not be something that you think about right away when you think about marine debris, but these hurricanes and tsunamis and natural disasters have a great way of knocking stuff that shouldn't be in the ocean into the ocean, and that becomes marine debris, so we deal with that as well. And lastly, regional coordination, and that's kind of where I come in. So myself and nine others are regional coordinators for the program, but I am the luckiest of all of them because I get New England. And that means I get to help with projects that are in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and sometimes with our partners in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick as well. Um, but we all, 10 of us, work together on different projects that our partners are doing. We help coordinate everybody so that we're working towards a common goal and that we can measure our success over time. And the main way that we do that is through our action plan. And I'm very happy to say we've been working on a Gulf of Maine marine debris action plan for a long time. We recently met in Gloucester in April to finalize the plan. And it's going to be published next week, if it is the last thing I do. Some people in the room are a part of it. So thank you for all of your work on that. Um, we have four different working groups within the action plan. Those are consumer debris, derelict fishing gear, microplastics, and wildlife and habitat impacts. So just to give you kind of an idea of the work that we're doing with the action plan, um, for the consumer debris, one project I'll mention is um, the Trash Shouldn't Splash project, which is run out of Sea Education Association. It's actually started by some middle school students, and they worked with restaurants in Falmouth, Massachusetts. They made a toolkit. So if you're interested in working with restaurants and switching all of their single-use items for usable items, they kind of put all the lessons that they learned and mistakes that they made online so you don't have to make them again. And that's trashshouldn'tsplash.org. For a derelict fishing gear, one thing we're doing, aside from large removal projects, is building monofilament recycling bins, which are the little, they look kind of like periscopes, and we put them in popular recreational fishing areas so that we can recycle that line. Um, for microplastics, a lot of what has come up so far is kind of standardizing the citizen science that's going on around microplastics so that we can compare all the data to each other, which is a huge feat if you're familiar with it. And for wildlife and habitat impacts, we're working really hard to study our stranding records a little bit harder and see if we can make correlations between marine debris interactions and protected species. So this will be a five-year plan. It's from 2019 to 2024. Um, hopefully, at the end of those five years, we'll just have cleaned up all the trash and we can all get new jobs and move along. Um, but if that doesn't happen, we'll make a new plan and keep on working at it. Um, so if you have questions about any of that, if you have education and outreach questions, who to contact in the region on who's doing what, if you want to link up on any project, I'm more than happy to talk anytime. That is my job as a regional coordinator. And I have my um, contact information there. Thank you. Great job, thank you. John Scott, senior chemist at the University of Illinois, Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. My research interests include emerging contaminants, and I've been studying microplastics for about the last five years. 
So back in 2015, NOAA had actually published a method for analysis of microplastics in um, waters and sediment samples. And uh, this process involved a wet sieve pr procedure to isolate the small materials, a digestion procedure to remove the organic matter, a density separation to isolate the microplastics from the inorganic material, a filtration step to get in on a filter, and then followed by microscopic examination. Now, in my opinion, this is the closest thing we have to a standardized method. And over the years, people um, are publishing studies where they're omitting these stage, certain stages in this process, and they're also making ma major modifications to these procedures. So now it's very difficult for us to compare studies and data sets across from one to the other. So there really exists a need for a standardized, robust method. So one of the things my group is doing is we've gone through the literature, and we found the most common methods employed, and we are running them in parallel and we are evaluating the pros and cons of each method on an even playing field. And we're looking at things like water samples, sediment samples, biological tissues, and even consumer products. So we hope to uh, basically address this problem through this project, that we're very focused on this density separation stage. Now the standard NOAA method uses sodium chloride, which will only get you to a density of about 1.2 to 1.3 grams per liter. Now here are some examples of the densities of some common plastics. And at this density range, we're actually missing things like certain forms of PVC, polyester, and even fluoropolymers. So at ISTC, we've actually developed a, a salt mixture that get us to 2.3. We believe a lot of the data out there is actually biased low because it's not getting to the right density. So that's where we're at right now. We're very excited about this. And uh, hopefully in the year or so when we publish this data, we can add to the standardized methods. Okay, so the other thing we're very heavily involved in is the identification of microplastics. And we employ the pyrolysis gas chromatography mass spect spectrometry technique, which we heard about before. And basically most of the identifications out there is done by infrared. And uh, infrared's nice because it's fast, but it can not identify black materials. And also, this technique can identify materials that are very small, and it can provide a lot more information about these materials. Um, and it can also even detect additives in these materials. <clears throat> so here's an example of what the data looks like. We saw this before, and this is a reference material, but here you can see this is a karst water, groundwater sample that we analyzed in our lab, and it matches well with the polyethylene reference material. But if we wanted to, we can look really deep at these peaks and look at the ratios of them and the identities of them, and we can actually tell you if the material is low density or high density. In addition, for nylon, we can tell you what form of nylon it is or what form of polyester it is. So the information we get is a lot more detailed. In my example here, too, you can also see some additional peaks in our karst sample, like at nine minutes, 11 minutes, and these are additives that are in that karst microfiber. And lastly, beyond the analysis of microplastics, we're also interested in chemical absorption of microplastics in the environment. And here, one of our projects, we've actually made microplastics, and we have put them in a surface water body in Lake Muskegon, Michigan. And at certain time points, we will go and pull them out. And we're looking at three types of plastics. And this study is ongoing, but even within three months, we could tell you that polyethylene absorbs more of the environmental pollutants than polypropylene or polyester. Uh, within the first month, we saw polyethylene actually concentrate polyaromatic hydrocarbons about 280 times the background concentration. And for polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, we saw them concentrate about 360 times the background concentration. The other class of compounds we looked at were called pre-PFAS. We heard about perfluorinated alkylated substances earlier, and they're of great interest to people, and they're chemically much different than these legacy pollutants. And we see them concentrate about 240 times the background concentration within three months. However, the interesting thing here is they're not sticking to the plastics, but yet we found that they're sticking to the biofilms that are forming around these plastics. So it's very important we need to not only consider the plastics, but also the organic matter and bacteria that's associated with them. So with that, thank you, and I look forward to our discussion.
right, so I'm Karen Simpson. I'm an environmental scientist at the EPA. Oh, <laughs> now it was. Was it not working before? Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to take a minute to talk a little bit about the surface water branch within the water division at EPA because we're doing a lot of different work that I think um, is relevant to this conference today and obviously the work that I do. So um, I'm in the surface water branch and the surface water branch is composed of four different sections, the National Estuary Program and Marine Protection section, the Watershed and Nonpoint Source Management section, which is where I am, uh, the Wetlands Protection section and Water Quality Standards section. Uh, we have a bunch of different state programs. We have six nonpoint source programs, five beach monitoring programs, six TMDL and water quality standards programs, and six wetland protection programs. We also have six watershed programs, which are our national estuary programs throughout the region. Casco Bay up in Maine, Piscataqua, Mass Bays, Buzzards Bay, Narragansett Bay, and Long Island Sound. And then we also have regional programs and partnerships, which are collaborations of multi-state and multi-watershed stakeholders. And we have the Lake Champlain Basin Program, the Southeastern New England Program for Coastal Watershed Restoration, and the Gulf of Maine Council on the Marine Environment and National Regional Ocean Council which is not a mouthful at all. Um, and then we have our topic-based programs, and there are way too many uh, that we work on here in the surface water branch to list, but here are some that I think could be relevant for today's discussion. Um, we have folks working on stormwater best management practices. They work with our stormwater permits group to identify what those, what we call BMPs are. Um, we have folks working on ocean, and ocean disposal and dredging. Uh, we have an urban waters program, and we have a trash-free waters program. And I am the program coordinator for the Southeast New England Program for Coastal Watershed Restoration, which focuses mainly on nutrients and stormwater and identifying innovative, regional, strategic ways to deal with those particular issues throughout the Southeast New England region, which is Rhode Island, um, Buzzards Bay, Watershed, and the Cape. And then I'm also the Trash Free Waters Program Regional Coordinator, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, also wanna mention that throughout my 10 years at EPA, I have, um, I started in the Urban Waters Program, so I have some experience there, and I also did a little bit of work in the Wetlands Protection Branch looking at um, wetland assessments. All right, so the, the Trash Free Waters Program is a national program. It was established in 2013. It was kind of a revamp of the Marine Debris Program at EPA. Um, essentially, they realized that they wanted to expand the scope of the program and look more land-based, look more inland. So the program is a strategic approach to support innovative aquatic trash prevention and reduction policies, programs, and initiatives by many public, private, and nonprofit stakeholders. So the program goals are to reduce the volume of trash entering U.S. waterways, to emphasize the need for proactive measures more than reactive measures, so to reduce it at the source rather than some kind of capture device at the sink, um, to identify opportunities to integrate trash-free waters principles into existing programs. So um, each of these programs has its own kind of planning document, and in the planning, we really try to incorporate trash-free waters program principles and goals into all of these programs. So that's why I kind of wanted to outline this slide. Um, and then my role as coordinator is to identify who's doing what, where in New England. So that's kind of why I'm here. I have that lens and the next and today and tomorrow is to kind of see who's doing what. Um, and then to identify opportunities that integrate both EPA program goals and Trash Free Waters pro program goals. And then to collaborate with EPA's Office of Research and Development. Um, they are doing a lot more now with microplastics research in the past few years, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so we also have EPA's Office of Research and Development. They have labs throughout the country, and they are currently updating their strategic research action plan for 2020 to 2024. Um, and this figure is a, um, the previous one, which you can find online. 
just Google EPA Strategic Research Action Plan, and you can find the previous one. But I really wanted to uh, point out that one of the priorities that the Office of Research and Development is working on is microplastics for this year. And they're particularly looking at um, establishing reliable and reproducible methods for micro and nanoplastics collection, extraction, characterization, and quantification in sediment and surface water. Um, so that's kind of the broad uh, strategic plan for the Office of Research and Development. One of the uh, labs, which is Atlantic Ecology Division in Narragansett, Rhode Island, they are now performing a study on standardizing a method for extracting and isolating micro microplastics in marine sediments. Um, and then we have another uh, study that was actually published in the Marine Pollution Bulletin in 2018 that they did uh, through the Gulf Ecology Division in Gulf Breeze, Florida. And they looked at the ingestion of microbeads and microfibers by coral. And that is published, so you can all go see that. But the spoiler is that coral actually ingest it, but then spit it back out within 48 hours, which is, seems great, but they're still exposed to whatever is on that microplastic for 48 hours. So they really have to look into um, that that route of exposure. I think that's that was it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, panelists. Uh, that was very good. John, let's start with you. Um, we had some questions this morning about measuring plastics, and uh, yeah, it, there was seemed like there was some curiosity there, and then some feeling like the size doesn't necessarily, it's not that important. I don't know, that's the way I interpret it. Anyway, my question is this, how are you measuring the accumulation of plastic in the environment? And what are the particular challenges and opportunities associated with that? Yeah, I'm trying to closely as follow, cl follow as closely the standard method, but um, kind of make it a little bit better. The problem is everybody's doing it different ways. Um, we really need a standardized method and we need to get everybody to adopt it so we can compare data across data sets. So yeah, that's, I think there's a real need for that. Um, we really, the data that's out there, we can't say it's garbage, but we, it's not as reliable as we'd like it to be. And moving forward, the data sets that we generate, we want it to be as very robust and as reliable as possible. And I think I think we we heard some of that as well. Like there's a there's a desire for some sort of standardization. Yep. Uh, any any thoughts on how that might come about? Yeah, we're, we're trying to work on it yeah. definitely. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, getting uh, and proving to everybody, you know, this is the best method, yeah. and that's why we like taking the most common methods and running them in parallel. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, yeah. great. Karen, what about you? Any thoughts on that? Um, on the accumulation of. How it's measured? Yeah, challenges and opportunities. Um, I think just thinking about floating debris, typically we measure it just by what people go around and collect through a beach cleanup or some kind of volunteer-driven event, and then hopefully report that data back to EPA or another um, federal agency so that they can compile it and, and identify. But I think that it's impossible to measure everything. We're always going to miss something. And the figure that came up this morning was at 700 billion water bottles. What's happening to all those 700 billion? What percentage is getting recycled? But then what compartments does it kind of disperse to in the environment? And honestly, it's impossible to know because it breaks apart. Um, it goes into different uh, ecosystems. So I think it's, it's very difficult to measure how plastic is accumulating. <laughs> you can really only measure how much you're removing from the system. Um, and I think there's a lot of programs that are doing that on the ground uh, at the local level, which is great. And I think that we should continue to do that and as much as possible to report that data um, so that we know how much we're removing. We know what the extent of the problem actually is. So then we can communicate that to the public. Um, there are certain apps that are available that uh, folks can download on their smartphones and identify what types of trash they are collecting. And then that is aggregated um, by whoever is kind of owns that app um, for their marketing piece and their communication. Um, and then... I do want to go back to size. It was mentioned before, and it's very important. Obviously, you see these things get smaller in size. They have a greater potential to cross biological membranes. The only problem is, like for my group, 
you know, the lowest that we could go down right now is five micrometers. And we can go lower if we wanted to, but it takes a lot more effort. And it really is a lot more cost to go down to much smaller sizes. So that is definitely an issue. I'm sorry I skirted that, no. that part of the <laughs> No problem. No problem. You bought me some time to okay, think good. of my next uh, point. I think my last point um, is that the other way to measure accumulation of plastics is by modeling or GIS-based approaches. Uh, one thing that we are interested in at EPA is looking at where the hot spots are for where trash could potentially be accumulating, um, not just on the coast, but also inland. Um, in the freshwater estuaries and the rivers. So um, something that we are looking into to identify where the priority areas are. Yeah, John, you brought up size again. And uh, the uh, Demi, some of the uncertainties that you had talked about, uh, which I'd love, love to hear more about. Uh, one of them was the uh, commercial fishing. And you being out of Gloucester, uh, that's very important, of course. Um, can you comment on that and, uh, and some of the other uncertainties that you're faced with? Yeah, sure. I think the answer to what are the uncertainties is just everything, right? Like we, mm -hmm. Everything is still uncertain. We're still learning a whole lot. I think the Marine Debris Program has a couple of research priorities that we're focusing on with the research grant um, funding that we give to our partners. There's a competition every other year for research grant funding. And we have four priorities right now, and that is risk assessment in commercial seafood, definitely understanding what are the human health impacts there, um, but also bait and transport and habitat impacts and monitoring, like Karen was saying, to understand the types and quantities that are out there, but also how all of that can inform our prevention and removal efforts as well. Um, I'll also add that EPA did develop um, a trash-free waters protocol for cleanups. So if anybody has a cleanup event planned and would like to follow the EPA's protocol and then report the data back to us, we would definitely, um, I could provide that to you and we would be appreciative of any kind of data just to see what's out there. Okay, so we're talking about uh, contaminants with things like seafood. What about uh, in, in ecosystems, Karen? Uh, what has been your experience with uh, contaminants uh, in plants and or animals? I think you were focused on plants, correct? Yeah. Um, well, I have a personal interest in looking at the connection between microplastics and eelgrass. And um, so I guess my question is, does, do microplastics settle in eelgrass beds? And if so, how does that kind of impact the, that particular sensitive habitat? So I'm really interested in, in that. And a colleague of mine um, are hoping to take on a research project associated with that question. Um, I think that of, of the research that I've been doing in preparation for that, I've found that microfibers have been actually uh, found in the blades of eelgrass. And that may not present much of a threat to the plant itself, but it does pre present a threat to the fish that are eating, the herbivores that are eating the plants. Um, so that's definitely a concern. Um, and, and then I would go back to the macro trash, because uh, we're talking a lot about microplastics. But I think we, we can't lose sight of the larger pieces of trash and the effect that they have on plants because they can block out the light. Um, they can affect um, chemistry of the water in some ways. They can also um, reduce DO in some areas and alter the physical habitat of that particular ecosystem. In the uh, Midwest, uh, earlier we heard that wastewater treatment plants will remove a lot of these plastics. But the plastic ferries don't come and take them away. They have to go somewhere. And typically, they end up in the biosolids. So in the Midwest, a lot of these biosolids are actually land applied to crops. Mm -hmm. So one of our concerns is that these microplastics, and as they get smaller and smaller, may actually find their way into food webs through crop um, land application. So that's something we're gearing up to uh, investigate as well. Um, we're solicitating EPA for funding for those projects. And <laughs> <laughs> but that's on the plant side, we were, we were very interested in that. So what about you, Demi? Yeah, I think um, ecosystem health is really hard. I think we need to start linking individual 
impacts to larger community and population and ecosystem impacts before we can make any assessment on that. And I think accumulation within the species depends on the species, right? I think as we're starting to study, especially species that are important to commercial seafood, like bivalves, that they're really good at moving particles through their bodies, whether they're natural or synthetic. We are finding that they can just kind of spit them out and they process them well, so they might not be the best indicator. But other animals like seabirds, maybe albatross, for example, can ingest these plastics and might not have the ability to rid themselves of them. So they might be a better indicator of what's happening, but that depends on their bodies and if they're giving it to their chicks and what polymers they're consuming and how those are affecting and what size those polymers are. So um, there's a whole lot of questions we need to get to before we can start making ecosystem level judgment calls. And even if the bivalves uh, get rid of the plastic, there could potentially be some ecotoxicity sure. risk yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So what in the time period that the plastics are in the bivalve's body, are they leaching chemicals? Are they sorbing chemicals? What happens to them when they get spit back out? Are they re-ingested? All of that is still in question. Mm. Certainly a lot of great work being done, but an awful lot more yet to be done in order to understand this uh, very challenging situation. What about, uh, Demi, what about some unanticipated consequences from plastic pollution? Yeah, I think there's a lot of them, and we're learning more about it as we go along. Um, one study I wanted to mention was conducted in 2019, and it evaluated the loss of recreational value and regional economic impact from reduced spending on beach visits due to the presence of marine debris. And the researchers picked four study sites, one in the Atlantic, one in the Pacific, one in the Gulf, and one in the Great Lakes. And they calculated that a reduction to almost no debris would contribute an additional between 27 and $206 million of annual economic activity, depending on the site that you're looking at. But even more impressive than that is that a doubling of the debris was estimated to cost the local economies between 96 and $304 million. So there is an economic value that we can attach to clean beaches that people want to visit, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is the presence of invasive species. I think that's something that we didn't think about before is they can attach to marine debris and travel hundreds of miles to a place that maybe they don't belong. Um, that can be a huge risk to the whole ecosystem in question. And as far as climate change, I think the things that I think about are as wind and weather patterns become a little bit harder to predict, that's going to make it harder for us to know where the plastics are accumulating in the marine environment, which is going to make it, one, harder to clean up, and two, harder to assess which species they're impacting. Um, I think as the polar ice caps are melting, the ocean is becoming less salty and therefore less dense, which will make the plastics sink more rapidly. Again, harder to clean up and harder to find. Um, and I think maybe the biggest thing to think about with climate change and marine debris is that a lot of tiny fish, like lanternfish, for example, that are present in all the world's ocean, are a huge portion of the carbon sequestration that the ocean can do. And they've been shown to be ingesting microplastics. So if the plastics are harming those fish, we might be doing harm to our carbon sink, which, of course, is not something that we <laughs> want to do. So it's... Uh, it's not looking good, really. <laughs> uh, Karen. Yeah, I, I just want to um, add to the economic piece, because that was kind of one of my talking points as well. I think that trash can impact the economic value of rivers, beaches, and marine resources by reducing aesthetic value and can also kind of um, deter folks from using a particular water body for recreational purposes. Um, and also that cleaning up trash is incredibly costly unless you have volunteers to do it for you. So EPA did a study in 2012 um, of 90 cities on the West Coast, and they uh, wanted to figure out how much was spent to clean up litter or to prevent trash from the water. And they found that in these 90 cities, it cost more than $520 million annually which is a lot of money, and um, that uh, kind of goes down to an annual cost of $13 per resident per year. So it can cost a lot of money. Um, and then switching gears a little bit, I guess, towards the climate change, uh, at EPA we talk a lot about stormwater management and um, kind of trash management associated with stormwater, and I think that if there's inadequate stormwater management, it puts a lot of stress on the stormwater system. And so if you have clogged pipes that are clogged with debris, 
from trash. Um, it causes that system to be mo more vulnerable to flooding. And then if a natural disaster does occur and you have a stormwater system that is full of trash, then um, you also have the flooding issue as well. So I think that um, we are kind of coming at the stormwater system with trash at least, putting stress on the system from two different angles, not only the trash that we're inputting into the system, but also the um, more frequent and more severe storms from climate change. Demi, when you talk about economic impact, are you talking about fishing and tourism? Is, is there that more? That study specifically was on tourism, mm -hmm. but fisheries as well. I mean, no, nobody in any part of the fisheries wants plastic pollution out there. I think, especially when you're talking about derelict fishing gear, there's so many different angles that it's an economic impact. It's costly for the fishermen to lose their gear. It's costly when that gear keeps catching the species that they're trying to target because that's profits that they can no longer make. It's caught up in bycatch. It's costly to clean it up. Um, it's costly to buy new gear to replace all that. So um, the good news with marine debris, I think, is that nobody wants it. It's not a very contentious issue, right? Like, we can all agree that this is bad. We, we should probably do something about it. You're right. Way to squash the good news. <laughs> Economically, too, is the cost for tr treating drinking water, too, and, address, and then wastewater as well is incredibly high if even possible. So we have to consider that in the economic analysis. John, I, I think you being a chemist, you can also speak to uh, <laughs> some of the unanticipated consequences uh, of things that are added to yes. the plastic. Yes, the additives. Yeah, I would, if I had to make another slide, that's what I would have put it in there. Because the additives are typically there at very high concentrations. Things like flame retardants, heavy metals. Um, they're more of a concern to me than actually what's they're soaking up in the environment. Um, a lot of these things find their ways into plastics through recycling as well. Um, my colleague Andrew Turner in the Plymouth United Kingdom, he actually has looked at the relationship of the color of the plastic versus the, hev the heavy metals and flame retardants, and he finds that black plastic is actually one of the worst. Look around you. All your computers is black plastic. Everything around us is typically black plastic. That's the cheapest plastic available, and that's why they use it. And it has to do with the, how these things are finding their way back into the recycling system. So um, I think that answered, did that answer your question? Yeah. I, I think yeah. the additives. Also, in addition to that, the biological materials associated with these plastics. Several years ago, I co-authored a couple papers about where we found very exotic forms of bacteria associated with these materials. And like you said, it, caused, it can be a life raft for them to travel. You can imagine a microplastic going to the septic system and then carrying those pathogens out into the environment. So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Karen, let's uh, talk about mitigating risks of plastic pollution. Yeah, so I can talk a little bit more about the EPA Trash Free Waters Program. So I also wanted to mention, uh, I meant to mention this before, but I forgot. The uh, administrator of the EPA has three top priorities. Uh, safe and safe and sustainable drinking water, uh, water infrastructure, and trash-free waters being number three. So this is a priority for EPA, not just the regions, but also for our Office of Research and Development. Um, I've been the trash-free waters regional coordinator for about a year now, and when I started a year ago, there certainly was not very much priority placed upon this program, and in the last year, my personal workload has increased significantly because I'm hearing from my boss, my boss's boss, my boss's boss, all the way up to the top, that this is an issue and this is something that, that we as in New England are not doing enough to address. So here I am talking about the Trash Free Waters Program. So I encourage you all to go to the website, uh, epa.gov slash trash free waters. Um, there's a really great newsletter that they have. And what I really like about the newsletter is on the last page, after you've read all of the really great articles about the, the excellent work that Trash Free Waters is doing, they also list all of the funding opportunities um, throughout the nation that could apply, uh, that, that Trash Free Work is eligible for. So I think that that's um, one thing. And with that in mind, um, we currently have what's called the Five Star and Urban Waters Grant Program. Um, so this is uh, kind of a combination of two 
uh, programs, federal partners, all throwing money into this pot to do urban waters work. But in this particular case, they've partnered with Five Star. And so rural work is also included and eligible for um, funding throughout this. So um, it's for local organizations to improve water quality and habitats, which could include any type of plastic pollution work. Um, the grants will fund community outreach, education, and stewardship in order to help reduce the impact of environmental hazards, such as trash. Um, I also wanted to mention that the Treasury Waters Program has what's called a marine debris and plastic source reduction toolkit for colleges and universities. So if a college or university is interested in um, taking on uh, a path towards reducing their plastic footprint on their campus. It outlines four steps to identify what the footprint is to create a source reduction plan. Um, it kind of walks you through how to change procurement practices by identifying alternative and more eco-friendly products that could be used on the campus. Um, and then ultimately to help establish campus-wide policies for um, source reduction and a couple of examples um, there was one university in California that worked with their local subway on campus to stop using the plastic bags for the, um, the subs. And then another campus uh, was able to switch out all of their water fountains with gooseneck spouts, so it makes it easier for people to fill up their water bottles. So simple things like that. Um, and that toolkit can be used for college and colleges and universities, or in my opinion, could be used for any organization that's looking to reduce their plastic footprint and then I'll also mention that the Office of Research and Development often has research funding opportunities. Um, there's none open right now, but they do have a listserv. If you go to epa.gov slash research grants, um, they have water research funding opportunities and ecosystem research funding opportunities. So if anybody's interested in um, submitting a proposal on microplastics, say, that might be <laughs> a good way to do it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Demi, you have the Gulf of Maine program, correct? Yeah, so we will next week have the Gulf of Maine Marine Debris Action Plan. Um, so that is a great way to become involved. If you're interested, if you're doing any marine debris work or you want to be, let me know. I am more than happy to have more partners participating. And it's a really great way to connect with other people in the region who are doing similar work, to learn from them. They want more volunteers and help too. Um, so that's a really good way to go about it. And the Marine Debris Program has two grant funding opportunities every year. Um, removal every single year is offered, and then research and prevention alternate. So prevention is usually education and outreach type of projects. Um, research is a lot of microplastics work as well. Um, so right now we're reviewing our fiscal year 20 proposals for removal and prevention. So in FY21, it will be removal and research if you're interested in that. Um, that's a great one to apply for. And as far as um, mitigating risks, I think it's just really important to be careful the way that we speak and educate the public and that we're educating other students. I think in an audience like this, it's okay for us to really lay out the hard facts and say, yeah, we're in trouble, the earth is burning in plastic, it's not good. Um, but <laughs> um, I think I'm really careful, especially when I'm speaking to students, not to sugarcoat the issue at all, tell them what's happening, but um, be careful to point out the ways that we are solving it, labs that are doing research, programs that are providing funding, and cleanups that are happening, because I think it can be really easy for anybody to become overwhelmed with this issue and feel like we've gone past the point where we can clean it up or fix it or make any changes, and um, we're not there yet. We can still turn it around. So I think it's, it's really good to highlight the solutions that we have, the solutions that we're working on, and to continue educating the next generation. They're the best hope that we have. Um, with that in mind, I actually realized I forgot another opportunity, so thank you. You jogged my memory. Um, so the Trash Free Waters Program at EPA partnered with the American Mar Marketing Association um, to host a Trash Free Waters marketing video competition. So this is for college students to come up with, um, conceive, develop, and produce a video that will educate the public about environmental and public health benefits of keeping trash out of the waters. Um, and so to access that competition, you can go to myama.force. Dot com, so or just Google American Marketing Association, um, and then search for EPA trash, trash free waters, and that should come up. Very good, 
Thank you. And Demi, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, whether it's climate change or plastic pollution, there's um, a, a risk of grief among students and all of us. And um, we, we can't give up. We have to fight. <laughs> it's not all gloom and doom. Yeah. I there's mean, a lot of great work being done and, and more to be done. So, yeah. I mean, look at when um, Sherry Mason was still going around the Great Lakes. I mean, microbeads were the abundance of the plastics that she found. When we go back to the Great Lakes, we don't see microbeads, and it's because of the ban on these materials. So it, these things do work. And look at DDT. We saw problems with DDT and the chlorinated pesticides. So there's hope. Don't give up. <laughs> Sorry. Aaron. Oh no, very good, very good. I think uh, we have. Uh, we can open it up to questions. Hi. Um, it's Diana. My question is, don't you think it might be time to give an update to the definition of marine debris? That's my question. <laughs> I think that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, anybody? Um, so we have a definition of marine debris that is, it's a lot of words because governmenties, but basically it means solid solid waste, man-made solid waste that's either purposefully or accidentally put into the marine environment. There's a different um, part of NOAA that deals with oil spills, so we kind of, we work together, obviously, but we don't define oil as marine debris or any other liquids. Um, and we're kind of, we're governed by the Marine Debris Act, so it, it's hard for us to change our definition. I know there's been a lot of, um, there was a lot of discussion on the marine debris listserv about changing what we call marine debris, like calling it marine litter or plastic pollution or something like that. Unfortunately, the marine debris program can't do that because we're the marine debris program. We can't, that, that's a law that we are made by. Okay, so do you mean what we're calling it instead of calling it marine debris? The definition of marine debris, the governmental definition that we use. It includes plastic, it's just not, it doesn't say the word plastic. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Okay. I will bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. Along, those sure. same, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Along those same lines, even the word microplastic, I don't really personally care for. Because do you consider tires to be plastic? Because, yeah. boy, I find a lot of tire material in a lot of my samples. Right. Do you consider cigarette butts to be plastic? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Then fair enough. Those are all plastic. OK. Fair enough. Hmm. Sorry. Hi, my name is Adrian. Um, <laughs> So I had a question. Uh, I study estuaries, and so I was curious, um, in particular, what are some of the challenges when we think about trash entering our estuaries, our salt marshes, and some, you know, some of the most vulnerable but also valuable ecosystems we have? Do you want to start? You can start with that um, one. Well, I just think physical processes of estuaries and nutrient cycling and all of that kind of thing, just everything, soil chemistry, there's just so many, too many to list, I think. Um, and it's depending on what type of trash it is. Are we specifically talking about microplastics or just all trash in general? Yeah, so it can, and wildlife can be entangled. They can, um, they can choke. I mean, there's just so many different things. I think it's, we would have to narrow that question down a little bit to what specific part of the estuary you're looking at. And then I'm, I'm sure that there are articles that answer that question, but it's just such a, such a broad question. I can't really right. answer it. So can I specify to <laughs> maybe then to salt marshes? Because I know that you know, salt marshes provide a lot of, uh, for example, carbon sequestration. They provide defense against um, storm surge, et cetera. So maybe some of the issues related to those. Yeah, I think, again, if we, we just don't understand the impacts that plastic pollution is having, whether it's ingestion or entanglement or just presence and it's leaking all the chemicals and additives that it can leach out. So if we are potentially harming the things that sequester our carbon for us, we might be harming our carbon sequestering capabilities, right? And estuaries in general are kind of our filter system out into the ocean and vice versa. And if we're clogging them up with plastic, they might not be doing the jobs that they are actually made to do. So I think there's a lot more to be learned for sure. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Manuela, I'm at Sloan. Um, I'm uh, with a classmate, we're gonna do like a peer learning session for our classmates soon um, about plastics and trying to encourage moving away from that. And a big conversation has been about climate change. So we're really trying to draw out those connections. I know you just started speaking a little bit about that. 
Um, and I heard that um, both of uh, Karen and Demi, you mentioned, you know, um, obviously carbon sequestration happening lower in the food chain. Um, and then you spoke about stormwater systems. Are there any um, areas you might point me to that I should also dig into to really talk about how uh, plastic pollution um, is leading to further uh, climate change? Yeah, I think one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that, of course, plastics, when they're out in the environment, being beat up by sunlight and wave action, they could be releasing horrible greenhouse gases as well. Um, so that could add to the climate change issue. And I think there's also a really interesting dialogue that started happening about um, climate change kind of being pitted up against marine debris. I think as far as public perception goes, marine debris has gotten a ton of attention in recent years because of the garbage patches and the turtle with the straw video and everything else. Everybody has kind of ramped up their attention to marine debris and is paying more attention to it. And there were some articles published about how everybody's attention is being pulled into marine debris when really the bigger issue we should be talking about is climate change. I don't love that argument, obviously. I'm biased. But I think that we don't have to pit these environmental issues against each other. I think they're all things we need to be concerned about. There are similar steps we can take to reduce our impacts at, on both. Um, but it would be an interesting thing to talk about how, how these messages are being shared with students and the public and how we can better communicate them for our behavior change. Um, I guess the only thing I can add, what comes to mind is a study that I read recently, and I think it was either a crab or a fish. I'm sorry, I'm terrible with details. But um, <laughs> essentially, it was a study looking at the ingestion of microfibers by this particular organism, and they found that the organism that ingested the microfibers actually ended up eating less than those that didn't eat any microfibers. And so uh, they concluded that it was because that organism was more full. And so this could have an implication on ecological um, outcomes, uh, organism size. Um, and then, of course, there are reproductive um, impacts as well. I think there's a lot of studies on base scallops and um, other types of filter feeders on reproductive um, impacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we saw some good statistics on that earlier. And then, uh, Diana, you even alluded to that, uh, or not alluded very direct, about the toxicity and so forth. Very good. Hi. Hi, Demi. How are you? My name is Magdalena. I work with Heather Harbor Keepers. Um, I have a question about the production of plastic. I feel like we work so hard in trying to clean up plastic. A lot of groups, a lot of people out there are trying to, you know, that's what your job is. But I think if we can't catch up because the, the, the continuous production of plastic is, is massive. Right, so how do we work collectively, you know, within our capacities, whether it's, you know, non-governmental or, you know, governmental or, you know, within the industry to actually address the production of plastic so that it's parallel with the cleanup and the response? Yeah, I think it's good a good question. I'm sorry. It's a good Is question. Is it policy or, you know? That might, not, that might come up tomorrow, but... I I see these two problems. Number one, I think focusing on single-use plastics is the most logical thing, in my opinion. I mean, these things are designed to last forever, yet only intended for single use. So I think that the first problem is to change that, and change behavior, and, and stop using these things. So, this, so this, policy, yeah, behavior yeah, and that, policy? Yes, that's totally it. Now, the second part is cleaning up what's already out there. I don't even want to touch that. You know, half, I think um, I read a paper several months back that said that 50% of the microplastics that we find in the environment are 10 years or older. So that means that if we even stop cold turkey today, we still gonna have to deal with this for legacies to come. And treating it, the stuff that's already out there, I have no idea how to tackle that. But I think getting people to behavior change is doable, and that's one of the things that we should definitely focus on, so I'm sorry. I agree with that. That's my I think two it's cents. education. Yep. That's, um, your quote in the beginning, right, from Jacques Cousteau? Yes. The quote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. There, uh, there, there may be an element, I hesitate to say this, but there may be an element of uh, uh, action, consumer action, that needs to take place. Uh, I heard Bill McKibben speak two weeks ago about climate change and uh, 350.org, very assertive activism, and uh, there's you know, we're, we're pursuing it in an intellectual manner, which is awesome, uh, but there, there may be uh, 
in order to influence industry and government, there may be some of that that I guess you are doing, but perhaps we need to even kick it up a notch. And with that in mind, I want to um, say I'm Jenny Wells, and I've been looking at learning about um, ghost fishing gear and abandoned lost derelict gear and trying to understand where are the points that we could really make a difference. And I do feel that the point that was made earlier with the Plastic uh, Pollution Coalition video showing the chemical companies and the ramp up to do four times as much plastic in you know, 15, 20, 25 years as we make today, when we already know that annually we are adding so much plastic we can't manage now. So while I honor that we're getting better at trying to figure out what kind of microplastic bits there are in the ocean, don't we already know that we've got way too much of this stuff being generated that is being misused. I, I do think that we need plastic for medical things and other uses that last longer and are life saving. But this whole misuse of the individual single wrapper, single use, throwaway model, which was fed to a large degree by the corporations that were making it and still is being promoted in some ways, even though they are starting to invest in cleanups, we can't clean up enough to deal with it. So I do, you know, want to encourage us to look at turning it off at the source for the single use stuff that we can and need to be doing without. And I would like to see the urgency for that raised because I do, uh, I share your feeling, Diana, that it's just incredible. What we already know is so bad that why research it more? We already know we've got trouble. And if we don't start to make changes now, it's only getting worse. So, you know, can we be more urgent? And what, what would you recommend to help us ramp that up? Well, I will say that EPA, it is becoming more and more urgent because we are receiving messages from above that this is a top priority. But that top priority had to come from somewhere. It came from the people, it came from the politicians that support this. So eventually it gets to, onto my desk, but it had to come from, from some some political support somewhere. Um, so I think that it kind of starts with you all who are the advocates of this issue, is to create that urgency and then to get those politicians, and maybe I'm not the best person to talk about this right now, but I think that it all comes from you because I personally feel like I can't create that urgency. All I can do is just do what I'm told and help carry out this Trash Free Waters program and, and uh, help them achieve the mission that they're trying to do um, but I certainly don't feel like I'm in a position to help change behavior. I think it's more on the ground, local organizations that um, kind of have to rally around that and do that. Thank you. And to that point, I would just add that uh, we all can contact our Congress people, our representatives, our senators, and uh, meet with them locally, write them, talk to them, go meet with them when they're in your state or go see them in Washington. They will take a meeting with you. So let your voice be heard. Yeah, where you spend your money, that's a good point. Where you spend your money, vote with your dollar. So that's actually my question. Oh, Hello, sorry. how are you? Um, my name is Maya Clifford. I'm a master's student at Tufts, getting my master's in sustainability. So this is kind of my field. I love this stuff. Um, but to kind of complicate my stories, I come from inside the water industry. I'm a chemist biologist by training. Um, so when I kind of figured out how like business works, it kind of blew my mind. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, this exists. Um, and I didn't really understand. And what I'm kind of facing now and the question I've really Try, I'm trying to understand as a master's student and a future PhD student is what are we doing about supply chain management and is EPA or NOAA or any of the other federal agencies working to advise corporations or like is that connection happening because besides regulation these bodies like represent so much more. And I should also disclose that I'm interning at Mass DEP right now and they're really into 
talking to bottled water companies, for example. There are six bottlers in the state of Massachusetts, and they finally have been given rights to regulate kind of, um, but it's more of a consulting and advising, and it's been really awesome and powerful to see these professionals who've worked at Mass DEP for decades and decades, longer than I've been alive on this earth, to really help them and share their expertise in a really different and unique way. So just curious about what our bodies are doing with supply chain management, and then furthermore than that, like. Are you guys advising, consulting? How are you getting in there and doing the dance? So. <laughs> great questions, all great questions. I'm not sure I can speak directly to the supply chain piece of your question, um, but what I can say from the Marine Debris Program and to answer a little bit of Magdalena's question as well, is that we always try to include in whatever meetings or workshops we're having, if it's a big conference or if it's working on the action plans that we have in each region to invite um, plastics industry representatives, fishing industry representatives to be there and be part of the conversation from the start. Um, they, of course, are going to be less enthusiastic about things like straw bans and plastic bag bans because it goes directly against what they do to make a profit. But they do have funding that they can contribute to other projects that eliminate the risks of the, the materials that they make getting into ocean ecosystems. Um, so they are willing to be a part of the conversation. I'm always grateful that they show up because they know they're kind of walking into the firing squad by doing that. Um, they know they're walking into a meeting of people who are all angry and want to see more solutions, but I think we need to talk to them. And if we don't include them in the solutions that we are trying to come up with, they're never going to work because we need them, right? We need them to be on our team. Um, so that's one way that we can try to help, but I think more can be done, of course. I agree that more can be done. Um, I think that we're constantly looking for opportunities to engage the business sector in some way. Um, I don't think we're, t at least in my department, we're trying to get away from uh, telling people what to do and more partnering with them um, to identify what their needs are and to identify where we can actually help. That would also benefit, benefit us as well. So if anybody has any, um, I guess, recommendations for how we could do that for our Trash Free Waters program. I'm all ears. I would love to hear that. OK, we'll talk later. OK. <laughs> so I, I, you're real quick, I just want to chime too. So I've been attending these emerging contaminant conferences for the past 20 years. And when I first started going to these conferences, the physical sciences were really well represented. But the thing we were lacking was the social sciences. And now I'm starting to see people like psychologists, business, economics, and I really think that we need to bring these people to the table because they're really the solution to the problem. So I think that's very important. At the last conference I went to, there was a psychologist and she was doing fascinating things. I wanted to hug her after the conference. She was <laughs> studying like if somebody saw litter, they were more likely to litter. And, and you know, it was just fascinating stuff. So I think we really need to bring them in to this discussion more often. Sorry. My name's Susie. Um, my question has to do with funding uh, re being a reflection of priorities. So uh, as we saw in some of the charts, Indonesia is like the second worst contributor uh, to plastic pollution, but they have a $1 billion program to do what they can uh, to remove plastic and they're using it to make roads, which may or may not be a good idea, but um, they have a plan. And so by comparison, um, I'd like to know how much money is being spent within EPA for your program, because I think it's a little bit less than a billion. Um, I don't know the answer to that. And I'm being More. facetious. And, oh. um, and in the case of Indonesia, it was not bottoms up. It was top down, you know, by leaders being informed. So I think both have to occur, bottoms up, tops down, but I don't think it's just bottoms up. So um, if you would talk to what the budget is for marine debris, and then within that, how that's allocated, because my understanding it's mostly educational versus remediating. That's my question. So I can speak to the marine debris programs, mm -hmm. grant funding, um, program. So we do have two grants every year, removal every year, of course, and then the research and prevention alternate. Um, so we, the grants... Oh, these are grants to outside. Yep. Right. Grants. So I'm talking about in the federal budget. Okay. The money 
allocated within the federal budget to EPA's marine debris program? Uh, well, I don't know what that answer is because I think, so in my first slide that I, I uh, displayed, I outlined all of the different programs and each program has its own budget of its own. It receives money from Congress to do a whole plethora of things. And then we are kind of coming in with a trash-free waters lens to incorporate more of our principles. So it's not like, I, I can't answer that question because I don't know. Yeah, the reason why I'm I told asking what, is because um, when I found it was around 25 million, which seemed like a pittance compared to the scope of the problem. And so I was just- 25 million to the marine debris program? That's, I read that somewhere. Okay, I can, I can circle back with you. I don't know the answer to that question, but I work with people who would know. Because obviously, if you had more funding to fund more research and more awareness, mm -hmm. that would only help. I mean, we're not opposed to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I just think it could come within the agency as well as from outside the agency. Well, I can, at least for the Marine Debris Program, the budget, although it has been challenged in recent years, it has gone up steadily every year since the program has been in existence in 2006. So we are getting an increase in funding that we can use every year. Most of it goes into our grant programs for work that our partners do. Um, but it is going up. Of course, we want it to be more, but we are restricted by whatever the presidential budget and the congressional budget can give us. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <sighs> I had a quick question that's slightly different. I, I think it's actually for Richard, but you guys might know something about it too. I noticed you showed the image in the beginning about working with people from the space program. Yes. Um, could you talk to, have you given any thought at all and have you seen the, the animation that NASA has up online about space debris? I have not seen that particular animation. It's um, awesome. Yeah. It's really frightening. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apparently, I've, we've got a bunch of plastic and garbage floating around the planet, too, from blowing things up and collisions. So you don't know about that. I have not seen that, and uh, I, I understand it's a big issue. I think uh, we're focused on <laughs> our, you know, the planet Earth right now. Uh, but it's just it's, a, it's a, it's a great great point. It's something <laughs> it's something we're going to have to deal with. We you know we we could have seen this issue coming uh, that we're dealing with in the oceans and elsewhere, um, but uh, I'm not an authority on that uh, particular topic. I just wanted to bring it up because I feel like you know outer space, yeah. the ocean exploration. Well, you know, C Captain Cousteau called the ocean and diving the inner space as opposed to outer space. And uh, I met Rusty Schweikart through Cousteau. It, it's not maybe that well known, but they had a great relationship, NASA and Cousteau, and did a lot of collaborative work in the early days of satellites. When I worked for Rusty, uh, it was Landsat 1 and Landsat 2, and we were working on technology transfer from the Landsat program to the private sector to bolster NASA's image, all the great technology was being developed, but are, are we getting it out to the public? So uh, a wonderful relationship that uh, actually um, uh, just w was uh, amazing. I, I was going to say that uh, we, we should get that going again, uh, and maybe we can with future frogmen. I did, I'll take a, just a moment and say I did like uh, a comment that uh, I think you made, John, and, and echoed Diana talking about uh, kind of multidisciplinary, uh, at, at Future Frogmen, we have a lot of science, um, we attract a lot of science students, but we also uh, work very hard, we're inclusive, uh, we feel very strongly about being inclusive and also about being multidisciplinary. We want artists and musicians and poets and political science people and business people. Uh, yesterday we hosted a a video conference with a watercolor artist who paints fish. And we, we have these uh, ongoing Future Frogmen conversations that we have a live audience and then we also post them on a YouTube channel. So uh, I, I, I think as far as building, uh, you know, building interest from the public and standing up for these different topics, in this case, 
everything associated with plastic, uh, we need a multidisciplinary um, approach and to pull in the general public as well from whatever interests them, you know? Don't send me to sample microplastics in space because I'm terrified of heights. <laughs> Just macroplastics. Yeah, there you go. Do we have a question? Hi, my name is Godo. I'm from Tufts University. I'm doing my master's in sustainable water management. Uh, I have a technical background. I have an engineering background. So my question is for Karen. I'm interested in knowing the technology that is being used for trash-free water and for all of you. I want to know what EPA, NOAA, what technology are they using to actually battle this thing? I'm also with the idea that we've talked enough about the problem. Let's head on to the solutions. I would like to know what technology is being used in this IT world where everything is automated. What's being used right now? Ooh, I mean, trash capture technologies. Yeah, right? sorry. Do you mean technologies for cleanups or assessing the plastics or all Technology for cleanup. OK. You want to talk about trash capture? Yeah, I think um, like riverine capture is starting to be a thing that we're paying more attention to. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with the trash wheels in Baltimore and um, other devices that kind of sit at the entrance out to larger waterways from big cities. So when it rains, it kind of flushes all of the litter that would be on the streets down the sewers and into the rivers. And it's usually a, a major way that trash enters our uh, waterways. So there's these trash capture devices that capture the trash at those locations. I this is my personal opinion, not Noah's opinion. So like, off the record, um, I I think those are necessary. Of course, we need them for sure. We need to capture the trash that is entering the ocean, definitely. But I'm not sure that we should publicize this idea and show everybody that we're catching all the trash before it goes out into the ocean because I think it could give people a false sense of security. Like, it's fine if I throw my wrapper mm -hmm. on the ground because Mr. Trash Wheel will get it before it goes into the ocean. So, um, of course, there's sea bins and there's skimmers and there's trash wheels and there's all sorts of things. This ocean cleanup project and their giant thing that they took out to the garbage patch is getting loads of attention. I think we should focus more on source and preventing it from needing capture in the first place. I, I agree, and that's what the Trash Free Waters program is really starting to focus a lot more on is prevention instead of collection. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I may I'd like to add to that. I think that's going to be the thing that's going to uh, Paul Lake from Watts Water Technology. I think that's the thing that's going to really kickstart this whole thing is is make people identify with it, you know, like a baby at the ocean side and takes a, a bottle out of the out of the dirt and starts drinking out of it because they think it's clean water. That's going to really hit home for a mother to be you know startled and and and, and made to move towards um, you know some some goals. But that, that that's the way this is going to work, you know, from from the bottom up. Economically too, like I try to convince people in my neighborhood not to drink bottled water because I live out in the country, and I tell them that you know you can get cancer from this stuff, and they don't care. But when I tell them how much it costs, if I could show them that they can save money by not using bottled water, then they'll stop. That gets their attention. So that's my story about <laughs> about that. The other thing I'd like to add to that is that if if somehow the the um, the pollution police or something, I don't mean to make us a, a, um, a communism, but there's got to be teeth to it, okay? People throw stuff in the ocean because it's free and it's easy, okay? And they're never going to get caught. They probably do it at night or take a boat out or something like that. So the thing is, it's really got to have teeth in order to people go to prison. I know they've done it before where they've dumped stuff in the ocean and they found out who it was because it was some, something in the trash bag that related to the person and the doctor went to jail. So it's going to be have, some, have to have something like that involved with it where it's going to be a, a severe penalty so that people wake up, pay attention, and a lot of people will participate in it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle. And just in response to your question, gentlemen, uh, in the UK, what they've started to do is any of these recycling companies, trash companies, all these people that are picking up waste products, they're forcing them to put a performance bond in place of a few million pounds. So if they are caught dumping material on the side of the road, throwing it into a river and ocean, they use that bond to clean up the mess that's there 
thus not dipping into the public purses for somebody else's waste, more so more that of a private corporation type scenario. So that's an emphasis that some of us have been talking to in Washington to try to start that sort of emphasis and say, look, is this something that we can consider? Is this something we can put in place and stop having the general public pay for the cleanup and have the corporations or individuals that are making that mess pay for it? Uh, I have a question, kind of bouncing off some of the other things that have already been said, but I think one of the things that is uh, common among these really big challenges is that we can come up with a lot of different technologies, but getting people to actually change their behavior is really, really hard. Um, and so my question for you guys is, are there any like educational techniques or like things that you say to people that you've found to be effective in actually getting people to change their behavior around um, like how they use plastic or, or change how they behave? Yeah, that's the most important question, right? Um, I think just personally for me is to try to do one thing at a time is what I always ask people to do. And I think about my family, I always run it by like, would, would my mom do this? And if she would, then maybe it's a good test to like teach it to other people. Um, so not we can't go at somebody all at once and be like, okay, tonight you're not allowed to drink out of plastic bottles, use a plastic bag, use a plastic fork, touch plastic ever again in your life starting tomorrow. <laughs> That's just not realistic, right? So I try to say, okay, what's one thing, like one easy little thing that maybe you can try for the rest of this year? If it works for you, cool. If it doesn't, we'll find another solution and just make that small change so that it seems a little bit more digestible for people and not so overwhelming and easy. And I think that's the way that we, and I do, I mean, I do it myself too. I think of things that I still use that are plastic and what is a tiny little change I can make in my life that could make my impact less. Yeah, I agree, and we've seen um, earlier today lists of top uh, types of plastic that have been found, and I think maybe just focusing one campaign on one of those particular items could be beneficial uh, with the assumption we know that there's more that we need to do, but let's just focus on this one. And um, I will say that plastic bag bans are popping up everywhere, which is really exciting to see. I know Vermont just released a ban um, throughout the whole state which is great and I'm, I'm told it's pretty comprehensive. And then um, I also just read that 122 communities in Massachusetts have a plastic bag ban. And that's just one thing and um, I think that it's really gonna create a big impact, just focusing on that. Yeah, state of Connecticut just banned plastic bags. I mean, long overdue, but we've, we've done it. Oh, and uh, one of our local communities has banned all plastic, Westport, Connecticut, and uh, but I think, to your question, it, it is a comprehensive, educational, and we were talking about really marketing over here, too. It's, it's a comprehensive program that needs to be married up with, we, we keep the research going, keep the mitigation going. Uh, we, we put pressure on organizations, put pressure on the government to support it. Uh, it's comprehensive, and you hit people. Part of the education, I think, is hit them in the pocketbook, because uh, Diana mentioned a couple samples where she's getting recycled, uh, she's getting uh, discounts because she's using a, a recycled uh, container. And uh, she also scared the heck out of us with her story of health. You know, our, we're talking about health and ecological impacts. And uh, if people are ignorant, they don't know better. So it, it's a comprehensive educational program on, on that particular question. Yes. Hi, my name's um, <clears throat> Adam Trod. I'm an MBA student at NYU Stern. Um, it's kind of had a fun question for you guys. Uh, a lot of different solutions here. Um, if I gave you each $100 to spend on a solution for this, how would you do it? Oh, man. Great. 100 <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they won't even give me back to the hotel. <laughs> however much, however, whatever denomination. Right. I would invest it in communication. Um, I think we have a lot of information already about the health and ecological impacts, and now it's just getting that um, information out. It's translating the science that we've found to people who can understand it. I, I would certainly use every penny for communicating the issue. I think that's a really good answer. I'd, I agree with that. I think, too, um, programs that could change, like you were saying, college campuses or hospitals in, their, in the capacity that they can, or um, even elementary schools, aquariums, and places that people visit large scale that produce tons and tons of plastic waste all the time, just giving them a program to reform their single-use plastics would be really cool. 
I'll abstain because I'll shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> I do agree behavior change would be the most effective way. Finding a way to change people's behavior. I'll, I'll chime in on that too. Uh, back to the whole education component because in my work with uh, the young people, this young generation in college and university and, and even younger in high school age and probably even younger in that, so many really smart, energetic, um, concerned people that uh, are upset, I think, with the older generation. And many of you never heard of the guy Jacques Cousteau, but he was a real pioneer and he, 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 he was a real environmental force. And I wish he was here with us today because he would be raising hell. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would put that money in some fashion towards energizing and supporting the young people who are doing great work and itching to do more. Do you mind, can I, can I follow on that? Because yeah. it's, it's related. Uh, great question, by the way. Um, my background is actually more in renewable energy and I'm constantly looking at the overlaps and the, the similarities. One of the you know, big issues that's floated to solve that issue is a carbon tax. And I'm curious if there's even been discussion in, in the water world of a plastic tax, which then provides those dollars available to fund the communication or get better, you know, coordination among the groups. Just curious, you know, because we keep sort of moving upstream. Um, you know, yeah, you can put a ban on plastic bags, but if there's a cost to produce at the beginning that accurately reflects all the healthcare issues that Diana raised, it seems to me that gets more to, towards the source. Short question, long-winded to, has there been discussion around a, quote, plastic tax? And forgive me if that's out there, just I'm not aware of it. The um, only thing that is coming to my mind is that in places where they are leaning towards a plastic bag ban or have implemented a bag ban, sometimes there's a 10 cent charge for a bag that you would need. Um, but not, I mean, that's the only thing that I can really speak to. Yeah, I don't know. And that's the only connection I can make is um, with stormwater utilities to actually charge residents for managing stormwater. And then that goes into a fund to help the community manage stormwater. And uh, trash management is kind of in incorporated in, in that as well. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think it requires standing up and well, uh, we're fighting the petrochemical industry, so they're they're the supplier of the oil. So I'll say we just pass that tax on to the consumer. Would be if if the cost was was actually reflected to what they're putting in, all the healthcare costs. You know, if they were saddled with that, it seems mm -hmm. to me, you know, it's economics and recognizing the externalities. So so. <laughs> Wouldn't the carbon tax affect the plastic industry equally oh, it, to the energy industry? Because the product, yes, yeah, the so production. It, I mean, it's like carbon tax would be the single, eat, like, it's a big bang start. for our buck if, as a policy. Amen. Yeah, right. uh, okay. great start. Just making sure. Point, so. There are people looking at that. Really? In the what? Cool. Yeah, and I, I don't know, but I would imagine the majority of the U.S. states still do not have a bottle bill. They still do not have a deposit on a plastic bottle, which is hard to believe. Yeah. Well, it's, it's in a good number of states. Uh, I, I'm, I believe Massachusetts does, Connecticut does, uh, but uh, majority of the states don't. Something as simple as that would change behavior. It would help to change behavior. It comes back to the pocketbook. Yeah. All right, we have time for uh, these two will be our last two questions. So, hi everybody, again. My name is Timothy Aaron Medina. It, what I have to share is actually like a cluster between communication, um, the actual carbon tax. And then earlier today, we were talking about something else and hopefully while I say it, it comes to my mind. But um, I know that in my own personal family, when I started making my own choices of like, okay, I'm actually not going to use these straws because they're plastics more than the turtle situation. I just don't want to use these straws. My family actually started following along that. And it may seem small to everybody else, but to me, it was a large impact when 
my cousin came in and was like, close your eyes. And I was like, okay, what do we, yeah, you know. And she was like, open. And she showed me all these different metal straws that she bought for everybody in the house. And she was like, we see you all the time telling us no more straws. And I always used plastic straws. But then when I started to say no, my family started to ask. So like, I think what I'm gonna share is a personal challenge for everybody. Like, stand up for your personal beliefs and share that with your community. And by sharing that in your community, people are gonna understand where you're coming from. I don't think that it's like a huge, like, let me just knock down this door with a huge wrecking ball. I think that everybody is a huge wrecking ball. It's just how are you gonna approach it in your own community? And like in sustainability, we learn a lot about life cycle analyses, right? And it has so much to do with the carbon tax and a lot of fusion of different topics. But understanding the con conversation of energy and carbon and you know plastic they all all three of them are a very powerful force to understand triple bottom line so the more you want you more you start educating and i'm pretty sure this room has a lot of educated people they just just be more confident about sharing it within your community because i've seen even in my own degree like i just started my masters and there's people that are not eating meat all of a sudden. Like, just because we were having this conversation and leaving room for, like, a judgment-free zone. Like, if that's what you do, that's what you do, but I'm not going to indulge in it. And I remember when I went to Hawaii, and I lived there for a long time, I got socially shamed because of the plastic. That woke something up in me that I was like, wait, I don't like how that happened to me. I wouldn't want to do that to somebody else. So when I didn't have this cutting somebody down by the throat, people were really open minded about changing. So I think like just as again, as a debrief and a personal challenge for everybody, just like stand strong for like if you don't believe in plastic, then don't let your friends see you use plastic. <laughs> but, you know, like don't bend the Friends rule because you can't right. you can't have a whole people behind you trying to have an army if you're the first one to be judgmental. Okay, thank you. We, we I want to make sure we have room for our last question. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, not a question, just a quick point back to the plastic bag bans. I'm not sure if it came up earlier, but um, a Massachusetts plastic bag ban just passed the, the Senate last night. So it's before the Massachusetts House right now. So if, yes. Yeah. Yes. So last night uh, the, it passed the Senate and now it's before the House. So that's one action everybody could take is contact your, your state rep and push for it. <laughs> hmm? What should we do right now? <laughs> Um, it, it, I would contact your state rep um, there. It's before them now. I don't know if it has a good chance of passing, but it does have that 10 cent thing in there that half of half of the 10 cents would go towards a fund to help um, further enforce the ban and, and recycling. So, but, so just. Thank you. Thank you also to Demi, John, and Karen. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.